Welcome to Coffee House. Today we have something very important, very special. We've got two books, actually. I think this is the first time we're doing two books. We usually do two movies, but two books is a rarity. Today we've got 13 Bankers and Liars Poker. The latter was written by Michael Lewis, and the former was written by Simon Johnson and James Quack. <laughs> Quack? Quack? I'm not sure how to say that name. Anyway, So we've got two books. They're both about the kind of financial sector, and it's important. Uh, The world has been shifting, and the shift has been seismic. It occurred beneath our feet while we watched movies and flirted and argued over what to have for dinner. The financial sector grew and fed and mutated, and now we made it a behemoth and a monster with which we must contend. So the books we look at today have two perspectives. 13 Bankers looks at the aftermath and the society large systems that contributed to the rise of the financial sector and the destruction it has wreaked. Liar's Poker is a deep dive into the trader culture at the root of this decades-long financial sector ascension. So with that dire warning, and as always, we will talk about the contents of the book. We're going to go into an analysis where we talk about how good the books were, and then we'll do some big picture stuff. So we try to wrap it all into a wider understanding of the world. First, start with the contents of 13 Bankers. And before that, please, I have a book that I released. It's just a fun one. It is with some important thematic undertones. It's called Once Upon a Vampire, and it is linked in the description. If you would, or if you feel like it, then please check it out. This is 13 Bankers, the contents. We take the power of big banks for granted today, but it wasn't always the case. There was a historical process over decades that preceded our current predicament, and the process most dangerously involved a merger of major financial institutions and politicians. It began with the conflict between Hamilton and Jefferson. Jefferson was very suspicious of a national bank, but Hamilton eventually won out on that battle. Hamilton wanted the efficiency of having a central bank, but Jefferson was worried about the concentration of power in such an institution. So then we get speculation that grows up until the 1929 crash, which initiated a large amount of regulation of the banking sector. Then you've get you've got the Glass-Steagall Act, which passed in 1933. It separated investment and commercial banking. That was a big turning point in the financial sector. So you roughly have uh, kind of stable banking until the 1970s, and you have this hypothesis that arises, the efficient market hypothesis. What this suggests is that the markets reflect all available information. So whatever assets are on there, whatever the prices of the assets, they must be properly priced because the markets are reflecting all the available information. If they fluctuate, if they change, it's as a result of the fact of new information being injected into the market. Of course, this gives a kind of religious admiration to the way markets work. So you have the beginnings of the merger in the Clinton administration, and you have this long-term process of planting banking employees into major governmental financial roles. And this happened under multiple presidents of both parties. So what you end up with is ideological conformity and this ideological drift toward what the bankers want the ideology of the government to be. And then you have the advent of new products, new financial products like CDOs, like collateralized debt obligations, repackaging debt to create new products that you can sell and speculate on. After that, you have the government-bolstered subprime mortgages, which everybody should know something about. I know we read The Big Short recently, and we did an episode on that. This is 2007-2008, where the government had incentivized banks to give more loans to people who were less able to pay for their houses. So you would have houses that were mortgages that were issued with no credit checks, with no verification of income, those kinds of things. And people who were generally lower on the economic spectrum. So you have tons and tons of mortgages going going out and you have these major banks that are betting on the mortgage market and this is where Michael Burry and everything from the big short comes in where they see that they are repackaging into tranches a bunch of mortgages that are just absolutely terrible when they get repackaged and they'll be called AAA by the ratings agencies because the agencies are trying to get the business of the big banks who will go somebody somewhere else if they don't get the right rating. So after the big crash, the plummet, the nosedive of the economy based on these, these terrible mortgages, in March 2000 you have 13 bankers that represent the biggest banks in the United States or in the world generally, but they went to Obama 
in 2009. And these included the banks, the Bank of America, Citibank, Freddie Mac, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, and Wells Fargo. Of course, I do business with <laughs> virtually all of those. And six other banks that you likely haven't heard of, to the same extent at least. So rather than being reproached and split apart and chastised for what they had done to the economy, the Obama and the Obama administration supported the bankers. And we had this idea of banks that were too big to fail. And it turns out, of course, over the course of a couple of decades, the banking, the financial sector became the greatest contributor, the most significant contributor to political campaigns. And followed by Big Pharma, of course. So again, we have this idea of too big to fail. There are some banks that failed, Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, those are banks that failed, but the other ones were deemed too big to fail and giving tons of taxpayer money, which often ended up in the pockets of a lot of the administrators, the executives of these banks. And the author of the book, and obviously this description does not do justice to all the ins and outs of what they go through in the book, but the author of the book suggests that we cannot allow too big to fail. We can't allow that to be a factor in our determinations, and we have to break up these big banks. They have too much of an ability to create these seismic potentials for implosion, and so we need to do something about that, break up the banks, and not allow too big to fail. So that's 13 bankers. Highly recommend. I'll do more of an analysis. <laughs> I'm not going to just skip over it like that. But we're going to go into Liar's Poker. Okay, Liar's Poker is, like I said, it's a deep dive. This was a very popular, very well-sold well book at the time. It's by Michael Lewis. I think he's the writer of The Big Short, too, isn't he? But it was published in 1989. So this is a book. He went into trading and did it for a couple of years. And then when he got out of trading, he wrote this book about it. It's about his days as a bonds trader at Solomon Brothers. So the actual game of Liar's Poker is what he starts the book out with. He talks about what it is. It's a game where you try to guess the serial numbers on dollar bills. And you have to, like, bluff your opponent and have balls of steel to be indelicate about it. And there's this one game between you know, two of the prominent people there. They wanted to play for a million dollars for one game of this Liar's Poker. And then the other one said, why don't we play for ten million dollars for this one game in a bluff, but a bluff that worked to get him out of the game. But this is supposed to be emblematic of the way that they treated these extremely massive numbers and and dealt with other people's money, OPM. So first it starts out with him getting hired and how he went to, uh, he was talking to family at a party or something like that. And he had an aunt who was part of royalty and he was like goading her that she was not capable of getting him a job at Solomon Brothers. And so she, she took that as a personal affront and decided to do it. And so got him an interview. And at the time it was a thing to be, this was the mid eighties, mid to late eighties. And there, there were a lot of new things happening in this area. So he ends up in a trainee position, and he talks about the culture of training and how abusive it was, that there were back row traders and first row traders, and they, they were very different. And you went through these months of lectures, and you'd have these very cruel lecturers and traders when you ended up on the floor, and there's all this profanity and hostility, and when the, the new fish would come in, the traders would be especially hostile to them. But so there's this culture that develops and it was something like um, equities traders were on the, the lowest on the total totem pole and Siberia was like getting sent to Dallas to trade equities. That was the worst place that you could be. But the bond traders were the rock stars and they were the ones making, you know, most of the money. But then there are things that, that arise. So you have the first mortgage bonds. So these are repackaging mortgages. This is something that didn't exist at the time. It was something that had to be invented by the people at Solomon Brothers. And they were ahead of the game, way ahead of the game on this. So they did it, and they made an absolute fortune at the time. It's one of those lightning-striking moments, like people who bought Bitcoin, you know, in the mid-2000s, early aughts, or whatever they're called. It's one of those light lightning strike moments. And so they made an absolute fortune. They had the monopoly on mortgage bonds because they invented the product. So our trader, uh, the writer of Liar's Poker, ends up on, in the London branch and views a bunch of shady activities there. And like there's one instance where there were these bonds that were absolutely worthless, but they were being sold by one of the Solomon Brothers traders. They were on his sheet. Nobody could sell them. And so the author dumps them on one of his clients, convinces a client to buy these. And he's all excited. I got this big sale, but then has to learn from some others and then the trader himself that they're absolutely worthless. 
was. And it was a terrible thing to give to a client. And then they dumped, you know, a big chunk soon after that. And he talked about this, this situation where this client would c- call him every day just to absolutely rip him apart verbally. But it was a situation where that's all the client could do. The client would call and yell at him and be very angry, but nothing else would happen. He didn't want to lose all the money on the bonds. So he just held on to them and kept yelling at him. And it was this moment that made the author realize that that's that's all they can <laughs> they can send at me. So it was emboldening in a way. But what happened was at Solomon Brothers, the traders ended up being too successful. They were only getting a certain amount, you know, while the firm got the the lion's share. So they'd start demanding more. And when the firm wouldn't give them more, they would move on to other banks. So you had these other banks just start poaching Solomon Brothers traders with promises of, of greater returns. And this became a long term problem for them. And then you have new products, you know, the CDOs and other various repackagings of debts. Uh, you have all these ideas related to mortgages and mortgage bonds. And it created all this big speculation. There's one guy, he was at Merrill Lynch, I think, uh, was like the biggest loss ever. So he lost $250 million in a trade or in a few trades or in a year. I can't remember specifically the time frame, but he lost $250 million. So this wasn't something where everybody's just cashing out, you know, like it's a slot machine. He lost a ton, ton of money. And then they hit this one point where junk bonds were becoming the the cause du jour for traders, but Solomon Brothers was, was slow getting into it because a lot of the management didn't understand junk bonds. So it put Solomon Brothers behind. So eventually there's this uh, bloodbath where everybody gets fired. There's a bunch of firings, but he survives and gets this big bonus. And soon after that, he quits long before they have a, a much steeper decline thereafter. And there are a bunch of financial problems. So then he decided he was going to write about it. <laughs> but anyway, so th- those are those are the two books that I wanted to talk about. And in the analysis, moving on to that now. 13 Bankers is more important. It's... It's about the backbone of our nation. There was this beginning of a merger between big business and and Democrat politics, especially in the 90s, that has had serious ramifications that we have to be aware of. And Liar's Poker is more of the entertaining one. It was was really entertaining. It's kind of about the decadence. There were these uh, really overweight traders who just ate and ate and ate, and they they would have like uh, $50 worth of candy every evening. They'd send, uh, you know, one of the low people out to purchase this, and they'd have that, and they'd, they'd have people go out and buy you know a hundred cheeseburgers and they'd all eat that and then they were just making so much money at certain points it's not the decadence described isn't quite wolf of wall street decadence (laughs) you know i don't know how much he held back on but it was it was decadent it was gambling at the highest financial stakes so I'd highly recommend 13 Bankers to understand kind of what's happening, like how we got to this point. And Liar's Poker, like I said, is just thoroughly entertaining. It gives you a clear picture of the kind of people who end up in the financial sector and who are playing dice with your livelihood. So big picture, big picture. Okay, this is big, big picture. The historical context of the political parties. This is important. So the Republican Party was founded to counter slavery. That was the point of the Republican Party in the beginning. Uh, The Democratic Party uh, was the party of racism historically for decades. They were contra the civil rights movements, the Civil Rights Act specifically. Then we get a shift where the Democrat Party starts uh, advocating for government programs to allegedly assist the downtrodden. And especially after the 60s or in the midst of the 60s, there's a really big, important push for this. So, but historically, the the concern and the suspicion related to the Republican Party was their allegiance to big business. So the thing that the Republican Party was used for by big business throughout much of American history was to get the government out of what the businesses wanted to do. You know, if they wanted to dump toxic waste into a into a lake or if they wanted to invent new financial products or whatever they wanted to get government out of it and so that's what their allegiance to the republican party stemmed from and there's this big event obviously at the end of the 80s you had the fall of the soviet union and early 90s which seemed to vindicate capitalism and the representatives of capitalism you know this is the big banking financial sector and then after that you get the rise of massive tech companies so i don't know how many people have really studied this kind of shift but it's actually really fascinating and important because there's a big difference between the kinds of companies that we 
have now that we have to contend with. So a railroad, you know, back in the day that was a big company, or even a bank, they're parochial entities. They, they're not that involved in your day-to-day life or the things that happen to you. Whereas tech companies have this kind of intimate involvement in your life. They're involved in every conversation that you have and virtually every transaction that you make. They're involved in entertainment and employment. You have to use them constantly for employment. It's a very different posture relative to the providers of goods and services. So the result that we have is a business class that wants more access. They want more information. They want more access to your decision-making process. And they want more access to governance. Notice more recently how often a big business has to take a position now on politics, you know, on these political questions that used to have their own place, that we used to say, uh, you know, you can be on both sides of an issue, we're still all American. But now you have these companies, uh, you know, you made me a hamburger, I don't care about your position on abortion, but they feel like they have to weigh in on these things, or they're deciding to weigh in because they want to be more intimately involved in what we do and why we do it. So most recently, Disney commented on the Florida parental rights in education bill you know a number of execs were there were leaked there was leaked footage about them how they were contending with the bill by making sure that there were more gay characters in all the disney movies and then i remember the creepiest to me were these facebook ads that kept popping up when i was on youtube and they would say that facebook really wants the government to regulate big tech and why are they doing it now of course it's because facebook has a ton of people that were on biden's transition team and are now in his administration so right now they have the chance to control Control the legislation that comes out. And keep in mind, that was something that was a huge deal, and 13 Bankers was talking about how they would get people who were from the financial sector, and they would get them in positions of the government, and people coming out of the government, they would get them into these big banks, into positions in the big banks, which creates this ideological through line for those two entities. And of course, more recently, Big Pharma, they found this kind of capitalism hack. I mean, the question is, why have to appeal to a customer and sell the customer on your product, on the benefits of your product and the cost and all those sorts of things when you can get the government to take the money for you via taxes and force people to take your product. That's a whole new kind of capitalism. And it's so weird because one thing that has been really tough for me to come to terms with is the fact that the context changes so much. You know, you felt like there was a foundation before. While your circumstances might adjust here and there in, you know, the United States or in the world more generally, the country and the expectations remained steadfast. They felt the same. They felt like, okay, you have a line, you have a direction and expectations and you know what to follow even if it changes a little bit here and there. But it's no longer the case. We are at sea. And the sooner we realize that, the sooner we can identify the sharks and aim for shore. So what are the actions now? You know, we need decentralized currency. That's something that a lot of people are working on, but there are all sorts of possible predations related to that, especially early on. We need taking dollars away from woke businesses, the businesses that engage in this kind of practice, where they take a position and try to exclude people who have the wrong, quote, wrong position on an issue, taking money away from them. Support politicians, however hard this will be. Support politicians who are actually trying to break up big banks and big tech. And build your own everything. I just saw an announcement from the Daily Wire that they're going to start doing animated or at least kid-related stuff in contradiction to Disney and what Disney has been doing more recently. It's, I mean, the Disney is the weakest it has ever been, that's for sure. So this is the time. But so build your own everything, whatever it is. Banking, <laughs> entertainment, etc. Just build your own everything. So anyway, that that's the big picture. Oh my gosh, there's so much to that, so much important stuff uh, that we can go on and on about for hours and hours. But hopefully that gives a nice sketch about those two books if you had any interest in this area. And we will hopefully be back to talking about neuroscience next week and something else that we're going to plug in there. I'm thoroughly enjoying uh, getting back to some fiction stuff, so that'll probably be coming down the pike. Otherwise, I hope all is well, and I will see you on the next one. All right, bye.